Jesus, I will ponder now on thy holy passion. With thy spirit me endow for such meditation. Grant that I in love and faith may the image cherish of thy sovereign pain and death that I may not perish. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from earth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Almighty God, we confess that we deserve to be punished for our evil deeds, deeds, but we ask you graciously to cleanse us from all evil and to comfort us with your salvation. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. lesson is our sermon text this morning from Numbers chapter 21, beginning at verse 4. The children of Israel traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. And the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned, and we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed to the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then, when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. Here ends the first lesson. Bows to thee, for then shall we walk in thy steps forever, and hasten on where thou art gone to be with thee, dear Savior. Draws to Thee, Lord, lovingly, let us depart with gladness, that we may be forever free from sorrow, grief, and sadness. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, as we look at the account of the bronze snake in the wilderness, we see how the Lord does discipline his children, but also saves them. We hear that after the Israelites had complained, that the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, they bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. And this is God's word. 
Dear friends in Christ, a wonderful truth from Scripture about our eternal destiny is that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What that means is that even though the wages of sin is death and we deserve eternal punishment because of our sins, that God has removed that in connection with Jesus by Jesus being lifted up on the cross, paying for our sins, and everybody looks to him as eternal life. That God sent his Son not to condemn the world, but to save the world. So it's a wonderful truth, something we hold on to with all of our hearts. No condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. That does not mean that in his wisdom, God does not at times discipline those he loves. That God does either bring things into our lives or allows things to happen in our lives, which are a wake-up call, which are um, intended to lead us to repent of our sins, to confess them to God and to look to Him for mercy. Uh, this writer to Hebrews talks about that with a group of people who were suffering persecution and because of um, their faith in Jesus Christ. He says in Hebrews chapter 12, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten that the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. So the writer of the Hebrews is directly quoting from the Old Testament. And then he compares the discipline that we receive from God to the discipline that we had received from our earthly fathers. Endure hardship as discipline, God is treating you as sons, for what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? So God does discipline Christians with things in their lives. In the book of Revelation, in the letters to the seven churches, we hear this from Revelation 3.19, those whom I love, certainly God loves us, He loves us so much He sent Jesus, those whom I love I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, there's a situation in the early Christian church in Corinth that as they were celebrating the Lord's Supper, that it had kind of become a free-for-all. So after the worship service, they would have, I would say, a potluck meal. People would bring different food and drink, and they would, they would eat that and enjoy each other's fellowship. They are supposed to enjoy their fellowship. And then after that, they would take some of the bread and some of the wine and have the Lord's Supper. But there were those who were uh, mistreating other people and not recognizing Christ's body and blood in the Lord's Supper. They weren't properly prepared. They weren't uh, repenting of their sins before receiving the Lord's Supper. And Paul tells them that, God is disciplining you because of your wrong approach, and that's why some are sick, and some have even fallen asleep. So St. Paul certainly applied the teaching that God disciplines his children to that particular situation. So God does discipline his people, and he, he does that because we are accountable to God. Just as children, are accountable to the parents, and the parents want to train them to, to show respect and to obey them, so too we are accountable to God for the way in which we live, and God does send messages to us, not only through the Bible, but also through actions that um, show us that we are accountable. In Romans chapter 14, St. Paul says, For this very reason Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living, you then, why do you judge your brother? Why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, and every tongue will confess to God, so that each of us will give an account of himself to God. So we are accountable to God, and he wants to train us, and so he does discipline us. Now, we certainly see that in the Old Testament, but as I have read, it's still true in the New Testament. One of the classic examples that is used in the New Testament to teach that God does discipline His children 
is what happened to the children of Israel while they were in the wilderness between the time they left Egypt until they entered the promised land. And as they're about to do that, Moses is giving a farewell speech to them. And in Deuteronomy chapter 8, he quickly summarizes their history with these words. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today, so that you may live and increase, and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way to the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what is in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, to see what they would do, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And your clothes did not wear out, and neither did their shoes. So he, but he's saying that when you were in the wilderness for those four years, God would allow certain things to happen in order to, to test them, and if they did not pass that test, then he would discipline them in order to teach them so that they would come around. And so one of the first tests was they, they leave the land of Egypt. Um, so it was kind of a tough existence for them, as the Bible tells us, because they were slaves and they were hard-pressed by their uh, masters. And because the Egyptian masters thought the Israelites would become a threat, they ordered that all the boys be killed. Remember that and how Moses was spared? So it was just really difficult time and hard labor, but they at least had enough to eat. And they, they, they said they sat around in pots of meat and they, they could eat all that they wanted. So hard work, but they could fill their bellies. So they leave the land of Egypt, they cross the Red Sea, they get into the wilderness and they look around and it's like, there's nothing here to eat. And they became hungry. And what did they do when they became hungry? They complained to God, there's nothing to eat why did you lead us out here into the wilderness to die of starvation? Why don't you send us back to Egypt where at least we had enough to eat all the time? So God tested them. And what did God send to feed them? The manna. That, um, and, and the word manna means in Hebrew, what is it? So they saw this product on the ground every morning. And they said, manna, manna, which means what is it? And that's what they called it then. And they, they gathered it together. Then God tested them a little bit further. He says, now you collect it six days a week, just enough for the next for that day. Don't, don't collect more than what you need. And so some people thought, well, I know more than God, so I'm going to collect extra. And the next morning when they went to, the leftovers were filled with maggots. So they, the discipline was the food spoiled. And then God said, on the sixth day, you can collect twice as much because I don't want you going out and collecting anything on the seventh day. And that extra day supply did not get filled with maggots. And then there were some people that said, I'm going to go out and look anyway. Well, that didn't turn out well for them. So they, they were tested. They were also tested. Um, there wasn't always enough water to drink. And so they complained about that. And then God provided water for them. Um, God took care of them, and then, he, like I said, he made sure that um, their clothes didn't wear out, their shoes did not wear out. So they had, God was watching over them and testing them, but at times would discipline them. And there were other occasions where um, they would try to engage in battles that God told them not to, and they were defeated in those battles. Not, not the whole nation, but sections of them were defeated. So um, things being tested. And one of the well-known events is the one that's in our text, and I think you all learned that in Sunday school, and remember it, but we're going to talk through parts of it anyway. So, it's near the end of their journey. They've been out there for almost 40 years, and although they did not have a map like we do, they would have been aware enough of the general geography, and they knew that just on the other side of Edom was entrance into the land of Canaan. So, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So they well, we'll just go right through Edom. But the Edomites didn't want them to go through there, and we're going to we're kind of lining up to fight against them, and God didn't want them to be engaged in that battle. So he said to Moses, detour them. How many of you like detours? How many of you complain about detours? 
Sometimes we do because we want to go from point A to point B without going around through point C. So we don't like detours. They didn't like detours. They became impatient. And like we do sometimes, they complain. And as happened sometimes, they didn't just complain about the immediate problem, they complained about all the problems they had in the past. So as they were traveling, they had a detour, the people grew impatient, they spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. They're sick and tired of having manna every day for the last 40 years. The point is, they're sinning. They're not trusting in the Lord. They're not trusting in the Lord's representative. Instead of obediently following God, who had their best interests in mind, who had been taking care of them all these years, who had been protecting them, they complain. You don't like the way things work. Have you ever quoted this passage to your mother? At mealtime, we detest this miserable food. <laughs> There's some chuckling because we know what would have happened. <laughs> if we ever said to our parents, we detest this miserable food, there was going to be discipline. <laughs> we understand that because we are not to be complaining against those who have our best interests in mind and are seeking to take care of us. And we certainly have to complain against God's representatives when they are seeking to do what is best for us. And we certainly are not to complain against God, but sometimes we do. We complain against God, we don't like our circumstance in life, we don't, we don't like the way things are going on, we, we get upset with them, and, and that's not the only sin that we commit. That's, that's the particular sin in this section, but we, we understand that because of our sinful nature, we do sin against God's commandments in many ways. And because God loves us, He will discipline us. And He might do that in seemingly natural ways, He might do that in, in ways that we can't see the connection, but God does discipline His people. He does that here. The Lord sent venomous snakes among them. He bit the people, and many Israelites died. Now, if that were in the newspaper, at that time, had they had newspapers, it might say the children of Israel came across a pit of venomous vipers and they were attacked by those snakes because they disturbed their natural habitat. And the look at that is a, kind of a natural event where these things happen because of just, they happened to be a, a group of particularly um, disturbed snakes at the time and they didn't like being irritated and they attacked. It would be like if you, um, I would say accidentally disturb the hornet's nest. What are those hornets going to do? Yes, they will attack you. So that's, a, it might seem like a natural event. When we look at what scripture has to say about times when God would discipline his people in the wilderness, or once they became a nation and he would discipline them, God would use what we would call seemingly natural events but for a specific purpose, to discipline his people. And God can still do that today. We have to be careful, however, that we don't take a passage out of context, and we don't look at a specific natural event and try to draw a line between this, God is definitely punishing this group of people because of these sins. Uh, we, that's above our pay grade. We, we really don't have a revelation to do that. There have been people who have done that. There have been religious leaders who have looked at something like Hurricane, Patri Hurricane Katrina, which struck what the notorious city in Louisiana. And they said, and God sent Hurricane Katrina to New Orleans because of Mardi Gras mm -hmm. and the things that happened there. God may have done that, but I don't see God giving that revelation to us. Later on, I'm going to talk about how Jesus teaches us that whenever something bad happens, either to us or to others, we can look for a message, and if it's leading us to repent, then, then we need to do that. But the seemingly natural events, Ezekiel chapter 14, 
Uh, starting in verse 12, describes this uh, at a time when God would be disciplining the people of Israel. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, if a country sins against me by being unfaithful to the worshiping of other gods, not keeping God's commands, and I stretch out my hand against it to cut off its food supply, naturally meant cut off its food supply, famine, and send famine upon it, and kill its men and their animals. Even if these three men, and these are people renowned in the Old Testament whom we would say don't deserve to be disciplined, although one of them does go through a lot of difficulty in his life, Noah, Daniel, and Job. If Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they could save only themselves by their righteousness, declares the sovereign Lord. Or if I send wild beasts through that country, and they leave it childless and become desolate so that no one can pass through it because of the beast. That's not a natural disaster that we think of too often, uh, but certainly there's still parts of the world where you really have to be careful about the, the wild beasts that are um, in that area. Just off the top of my head, I'm thinking that the golf season has resumed in Wisconsin. Not that any of you golf, but... I have heard that if you go golfing in Florida and you hit your ball in the swamp, why do you not retrieve your golf ball from the swamp? Because there are crocodiles there, which are very dangerous, seemingly natural thing, but then the discipline might be you got attacked because you didn't follow the rules. But um, but the seemingly natural events of a wild beast, God says that he's sending them, or if I bring a sword against that country, which is an example of warfare, um, or a plague. In verse 19, if I send a plague into that land and pour out my wrath upon it through bloodshed, killing its men and their animals, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they could save neither son nor daughter. They could save only themselves by their righteousness. For this is what the sovereign Lord says, how much worse will it be when I send against Jerusalem my four dreadful judgments, sword and famine and wild beast and plague to kill its men and their animals. And in the book of Amos, there God is using the plague of locusts to discipline his people. The point is that in the Bible, we are told of how God would use natural disasters to bring discipline upon his people in order to call them to repentance. And that God can use seemingly natural events in our lives today to call us to repentance. Again, not drawing a specific line between a cause and effect, but uh, really following what Jesus has to say on this subject. Uh, we are told in Luke chapter 13 that some people who were present at that time told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? And they would have gone, yeah, that's why we brought it up. Because they are worse sinners. This is why it happened that way. That's what they were thinking. And Jesus knew that was what they were thinking, so he asked this rhetorical question. Jesus answered, I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. And then Jesus used another current event. Or those 18 who died in the tower in Siloam fell on them. It was an industrial accident. They were, must have been building it and it gave way. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. And then he told a parable. He said a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been looking or fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down, why should it use up the soil? Serve the man reply, leave it alone for one more year, I'll dig around it and fertilize. I'll dig around and fertilize it means I will do things to try to get it to um, be more fruitful. And the application is God, instead of cutting us off, will at times allow things to happen or even send things into our lives which are meant to discipline us so that we will repent and not perish. And so, the thing is, as we see these things happening, either in a broad spectrum, and read about them in the news, or if it's happening locally, when bad things are happening, a possible lesson is 
God may be using that to discipline us individually for our sins and that we ought to turn to God and repent of our sins and look to Him for forgiveness, which He assures us of, not because we repented, but because of who Jesus Christ is and what He has done for us. Going back to the account of the bronze snake, the people who were being disciplined, there were those who were dying, they asked Moses to pray for them, and Moses does that, and they very specific, take the snakes away. Have them all just slip it off, don't bother us anymore. Is that what happened? No. God did something else. And, and looking into the future, as God can do, God said to Moses, make a serpent out of bronze and put it up on a stake, on a pole. And tell the people this promise. If you look at it, believing in God's promise, even if you're bitten, you won't die. And so they were saved not because God took away the problem, but because God made a promise that he would save them if they looked at him in faith. Interesting thing about that bronze serpent, that it stayed with the Israelites for centuries. And we are told that at the time of Hezekiah, that some people began to worship it. They were never supposed to worship it. They were only to look at it as a connection with God's promise. But when they started to treat it as an idol, it was destroyed. But imagine in that in-between time. You're at a place in Jerusalem, and you're on a tour, and you're with your parents, or as a parent, you're with your children, and you come across this artifact, and there's this pole, and it's got a bronze snake on it, and your child asks you, what does that mean? And you say, well, that, that's a very special artifact. Moses made that in the wilderness centuries ago, and then he would tell the story of what had happened. And so we don't have that artifact anymore, but we still have the account of what did happen. And that's still known to us today. It was certainly known to Jesus, who talked about it to Nicodemus in our Gospel lesson. And Jesus is teaching Nicodemus about uh, being saved and being born from above and, and trusting in Him as the Savior. And He says, just you know, just as Moses lifted up that bronze snake in the wilderness, and Nicodemus would go, I remember that. I, I know that. I, I know my Bible. He said, just as Moses did that, so to God, will raise up the Son of Man. The Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who looks to Him will be saved. And maybe Nicodemus didn't understand that. It takes as well as the Son of Man must be lifted up. I'm not sure what that means. But several years later, because Jesus taught this early in His ministry, several years later, we are told that Nicodemus himself saw Jesus being lifted up. He was there at the crucifixion, because after Jesus died, it was Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea who came forward and took the body of Jesus and buried him in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. But Jesus said, whoever looks to Jesus who's been lifted up will be saved. Not just because of a promise, but because of what Jesus did on that cross. Because it is on that cross that Jesus offered himself as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. And so because our sins are paid for, we are saved. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Even though we are disciplined at times, we understand that God has forgiven us of our sins and we are saved for all eternity. As we look forward to that day, we must confess that at times we complain and commit other sins. And that at times God will work in our lives in very clear ways at times that He is disciplining us. And when that happens, remember that God loves you and that He's using that discipline to have us turn from our evil ways, to look to God, and that God forgives our sins because of what Jesus Christ did for us. We look to Him in faith and receive that forgiveness. Amen. Amen. Oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. 
Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Thank you.